who's working to defend women's sex race rights in your country and do the groups work together? So there are a few women's groups fighting for gender-based rights, so um, I wouldn't say that they're really feminists. But uh, even these feminists, it's very interesting in my country that feminist organizations receive no funding, but the, the LGBT ones the, do, or the trans organizations do have quite a lot of funding. So that's, that's uh, you know, it says something about the country, I guess. Uh, about me then, as I was saying that I, I found out that the social media is really a uh, strange way to raise awareness of women. I would say it doesn't raise awareness sometimes, it uh, lowers aware awareness. And uh, that's why I was, I started to focus more on, uh, on, on just like uh, publishing things on paper. So I started to issue my own zine, which is called Black Cat. And it only had uh, six issues because uh, I wanted to test it out if it's, uh, viable for me to do is to do, to do this long time and it isn't <laughs> it turns out <laughs> but uh i can uh, i still have the, those issues and i can send them out if you would like it's not very uh expensive so yeah that's one thing and then i also uh discovered that when i i, I really try to limit my I, I don't go to social media at all i, I barely check my mobile these days and it really, it, it, had, it has done so much for me, like just reading uh, Mary Daly's books and uh, also Sheila Jeffries' work <laughs> book and also any other books is just so much better for my feminist awareness or even like feeling hopeful about stuff. Because when I was on the internet, I was always feeling like uh, it's the end of the world coming uh, tomorrow. And now, yeah, sometimes I, I feel like it's the end of the world, but then I read Mary Daly and I feel better. <laughs> uh, or something else. So I would just like to really tell women, please go off social media sometimes, at least, and uh, read something. I used to be um, involved in left-wing politics quite heavily until about 2015, and I was sort of fully subscribed to the transgender, um, to the pro-transgender thing. And when I first became a radical feminist through an ex-girlfriend of mine in the UK, there were about two organizations. There was the Rad Firm Collective and there was the um, um, Lesbian History Group. And now in five years later, there's, there's a lot more organizations. There, there's a whole handful of them and there I I, I I would say um there's two divisions amongst them there are the radical feminists and then there's the gender critical feminists and there's a little bit of animosity between those because some people feel that gender critical organizations like women's place uk are not radical enough and some um feminists don't want to work with them and then there's the, the same argument that is also happening in the USA where there's some organizations who are prepared to work with anyone who's gender critical. And then there's some organizations who are a bit more, we need to, we need to be, um, you know, we, we shouldn't work with anyone. That's, that's sort of a short answer. But to talk about um, lesbian under lockdown, basically, um, um, Following on from the last answer, from the last question about lesbian erasure, we felt, a group of us felt, that lesbians weren't really visible. And in the 70s, they had lesbian strength marches, marches where lesbians marched across um, Leeds. So last year, a group of us decided to have another lesbian strength march, where we successfully, about 200 women, marched across Leeds with banners and everything. I mean, of course, we were followed by the transgender people, but there were about five of them and they looked stupid. And now this year, like a, about a couple of months ago, we thought, okay, are we able to have a lesbian strength march this year with everything that's going on in the world? So we decided, because it was Lesbian Visibility Week in the UK, um, organized by a magazine called Diva, who's, which is really queer, we decided to do some online events. And a friend of mine called Paula is a musician and she she's very, um, she's always, 
keen on doing open mic nights. So me, uh, because I have professional Zoom, um, me and her got together and are organizing something called Lesbian Under Lockdown, which is really brilliant event. We didn't think it would be. It's about 30 to 40 women who come once a fortnight onto Zoom and they come from all over the world and um, they come from america from alaska from australia from germany uh from um various parts of eastern europe and from every part of the uk and we just go around in a circle and and women can either sing a song or perform something or they can say a poem or or recite this one woman she does um comedy it's about trends she's trans welch because she identifies as Welsh, even though she comes from Yorkshire, which is really funny. And there's other women who don't say, who just say, hello, I'm here and I'm bored with the lockdown. And anybody, I encourage anybody to come along. So if any of you here on, on, this, um, on this panel or anywhere or anybody in the audience wants to join, it's, it's very open. It's once a fortnight on a Thursday and you don't have to be a great performer. So that's lesbian under lockdown but we're already discussing whether we should change the title when the lockdown is over and whether we should call it lesbian after lockdown or something else i'm going to talk about wlrn women's liberation radio news uh i'm a founding member <laughs> um, and basically in 2014 i in 2013 I discovered Sheila Jeffries, and um, a friend of mine gave me her book, Unpacking Queer Politics. And um, I messaged her and um, told her about what happened to me at the Anarchist Book Fair in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, how I had tried to do an anarchist feminist workshop and had been told that I was transphobic and then it got shut down. And that was in 2012. So, that was the first time I had ever encountered that censoring force of trans activism um, that, that would be aimed at me. I was shocked. So anyhow, of course, when you're told you, you can't do something, then that makes you want to do it. And so I just started researching and I got in touch with Sheila and I found out that she was um, uh, creating Gender Hurts, a, pol a feminist politics of I mean, a feminist analysis of the politics of transgenderism, that she was re releasing that book in 2014. And so being a member of the activist community in Madison and an out, you know, singer songwriter out in the community, just always liking to be involved in civic life and in, in public life in, in my community in Madison and always feeling welcomed and um, I would produce like these show events um, that involved the community radio station and I would go on the community radio station some from time to time um, and they had a, they have a thing on Monday nights where anyone from the community community can apply to go on to the radio station and do whatever they want. And so I applied to interview Sheila Jeffries and they said yes. And that was like six months before, I believe it was about six months before we actually had the interview. And in those six months, so much happened. It was incredible. Like all these people contacted me and told me, don't do it. You know, she's a hateful bigot. You, this is, you're gonna, it's gonna ruin everything and you just can't do it. It's wrong and all this stuff. And in fact, what I did during those six months is I found other feminists and Mishfest happened during those six months and I found a detransitioning woman um, to come on to the same radio show with Sheila Jeffries. I wrote a song for the occasion. So there was so much during that six months that led up to that one hour program. And I was shaken in my boots because the whole town, the whole city was listening to this thing and just waiting to pounce on me and tell me that I was engaging in hateful bigotry. And so anyway, they did. And so then I didn't get to do any more radio programs. You know, I, I applied to do a feminist, long story short, I know this gets really long, there's so many details. And I'm supposed to be talking about WLRN. So the other side of all of that censorship that happened at the community radio station in Madison where I live made me 
inspired to create my own community radio station online just with sisters like Donna, for example, she's a volunteer with WLRN to create feminist news and political commentary that's modeled after professional radio, like public radio in America, we have NPR, National Public Radio, and a lot of their programs, they have music, they have interviews, they have commentary, um, and they also do a world news segment. Democracy Now! is another example that has that format with all those, those three aspects. And so I wanted to have those three aspects and I wanted to create a team. And ironically, I learned a lot about collective and cooperative uh, organizing at my community radio station because they you know, are a community radio station and their, um, one of their premises is that people from the community can participate. And so I learned a lot there that I apply to how WLRN is run. And we just celebrated our four year anniversary. Um, we, our main thing that we do is we create a monthly program that has those three aspects. It has commentary, interviews, and uh, music and uh, the world news. And um, it's just been such a pleasure to get to know women from all around the world and to get outside of that noise box, that chatter box of social media. Maybe you, you take a kernel from that chaotic conversation and then WLRN is a place where we can actually have a real conversation um, away from that chatter and develop something together. It's almost like a consciousness raising group every month for the participants in WLRN because we talk ahead of time about the topic that we're going to be exploring for that month. And, and so it's, it's just a really nice model that um, I'm happy to talk about. And I think it can be shared for other projects, the other feminist projects that want to work collectively on a monthly cycle towards a goal um, and how that builds community when, you, when you're intentionally working together and communicating with each other and then communicating and broadcasting out. Um, so that's my experience to share with you about WLRN and thank you so much for having me. About organizations that are working to sort of upkeep uh, sex-based rights of women, um, there's a huge problem in the way we approach this subject like most things uh, in um, it, it, like most things are with India uh, we do not have a different word for sex uh, even though we speak more than 20 languages in our country we don't we oh, the word gender and sex um, are often um, used interchangeably sometimes very in, in, in very problematic context so when we talk about sex-based rights we don't really understand what it means because people um, there are organizations called Apne Aap, which I spoke about during my earlier um, uh, WHRC uh, talk, uh, where they're working for women that have been trafficked uh, into prostitution and they are working to rehabilitate them and their agenda is very clear and that's a very sex-based um, fight that they're fighting. And then there's an organization called Gramya where, is this, where there is this woman who has literally been the only woman who has openly talked about the correlation between pornography and domestic violence so far in, in this entire country. And apart from that, there are, uh, you know, there's there are numerous organizations that are talking about the importance of safety of women at workplace. So ever since sexual harassment and Me Too became very um, popular. People started sort of waking up to the importance of uh, creating safe space for women at workplace. So there are a lot of organizations like that. None of these people comprehend the importance of sex-based rights of women. And all of them are completely taken in um, by the whole queer thingy. So when you talk about sex-based rights, they don't really understand. What, what do you mean by that? Do you mean gender is what they ask you? So that's the answer to the organization. There are, there are some people, individuals that are working in isolation. It could be a consortium of lawyers. It could be a consortium of uh, psychologists sort of providing a um, very unique uh, service for women exclusively. Those could be considered as, you know, little offshoots of uh, sex-based organization working on sex-based rights of women. But other than that, we don't really comprehend what sex-based rights in itself mean in India. A little bit about uh, my work. 
Uh, I'm a filmmaker, I write, uh, and I also uh, do a little bit of activism here with grassroots organization in India. Um, I speak a few languages, so it becomes easier for me to sort of work across uh, uh, different parts of India. Uh, I completed a film called But What Was She Wearing, um, where I had the great opportunity to talk to Thistle about it in the WLRN uh, radio podcast. Um, Basically, it's it's just one of the many films I've made, and I've often sort of centered women in all my work, be it my writing, be it my actors, and more be it my films. There's one coming up. I really cannot talk a lot about it. It's going to be explosive. Some of you probably already know about it. I have already completed uh, 13 interviews. It's a lockdown documentary where I'm interviewing people on video conference and sort of putting it together as a film. It's extremely exp <laughs> explosive and I cannot talk about it just yet, but uh, you will soon be hearing about it. So that's in the making. And apart from that, I'm also the only person who is openly questioning prostitution and pornography here in India. So all the work that I do, I am also trying to sort of create awareness in the vernacular languages because uh, I believe that a majority of people in India do not understand English at all. And I think it is a huge disservice if I constantly keep talking about talking to people that understand English or to people who speak English without really doing any work uh, here with the women who don't understand the language. So in order to sort of alleviate that, I'm sort of creating a YouTube channel where I'm inviting a lot of guests, politicians, women's rights activists etc to speak in our respective regional languages and sort of subtitling them the one that i've just completed right now is to talk about the rights of women during pandemic if they are suffering from domestic violence and one more thing i also am the founder of women making films it's a community which has members from about 20 countries it's a only female uh, community where there are filmmakers you could be cinematographer editor anybody you can put your work together i'm sort of encouraging people to work with each other i also only work with women Women, even with my filmmaking, the one that I just finished is also an all-woman crew. So that's about me.